As Russia sent its ships down through the English Channel on the way to the Middle East, NATO forces from the US, Britain and Canada are being moved to Eastern Europe in what is being reported as the largest buildup of troops in the region since the Cold War. Tensions have not been higher in years. Yet the real catalyst for Armageddon is going on in the committee meetings of UNESCO, where a spirit of madness has gripped the floor. The Bible describes the frog spirit forces that will gather the nations in Revelation 16, verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Well, these spirits of madness, the meaning of the word devil, translated from the Greek demon, are at work in the halls of the nations of the world. UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, is charged with preserving cultural and historical sites, but has become a propaganda tool for the Islamic states. Reuters this, week, this past week reported, during the past two weeks, UNESCO tabled a, and passed a motion which effectively denies the Jewish connection to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Israel on Wednesday recalled its ambassador for, to UNESCO for consultations after the UN cultural body adopted a second resolution in two weeks that Israeli leaders said ignored Judaism's connection to one of Jerusalem's holiest sites. According to a text provided by Palestinian officials, the resolution adopted by UNESCO's World Heritage Committee in Paris refers to the compound revered by the Jews as Temple Mount, by the Muslims as the Harem al-Sharif or the Noble Sanctuary, only as a Muslim holy site of worship, just as a similar motion did on October 13. End quote. Well, before being recalled, the Israeli ambassador to UNESCO, Danny Danon, addressed the organization, and it's worth listening to what he had to say. I give the floor to the representative of Israel. Madam Chair, members of the committee, you have just adopted yet another absolute resolution against the state of Israel, against the Jewish people, against historical truths, and one which stands in complete and utter contradiction to all values with this which this, 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 this disintegrating organization is supposed to stand for. All this at a time when forces of radical Islam are destroying the history and legacy of many nations, demo <coughs> demolishing mosques and churches, and not even sparing archaeological sites. All this at a time when the state of Israel is the only nation in the region which upholds these values, protects these places, while allowing freedom of worship equally to all religions. If it were not so said, we would find it funny that an, that an international organization established for the purpose of documentation and preservation of history and heritage is extorted into being used as a tool to rewrite the annals of history. The battle for Jerusalem did not start with the last vote, nor would it end with today's. Israel is sovereign in Jerusalem and shall continue to exercise its sovereignty there, while Palestinians and other Arab nations continue to toy with imaginary and absurd resolutions, which put to shame those who place them on the agenda, as well as those who raise their hands in favor. Jerusalem's futures will be determined by the one and only historical truth, one which we will stand by with deep determination, willing to pay any price. The fate of this resolution shall be no different than that of UN Resolution 3379, adopted in 1975, which equated Zionism to, with racism. That absurd resolution was cancelled 16 years later, but the moral stain still remains on all those who adopted. It might take years in our case as well, until the Jerusalem resolutions are eradicated from the annals of this organization. In 1975, it was Israel's ambassador to the UN, the late Chaim Herzog, who tore the paper of the resolution to shreds on stage in front of the entire world. I have no intention of doing it in front of you today, not because of your dignity, nor because of the dignity of this organization, but simply because this resolution paper is not even worth the energy needed for tearing it to shreds. It will be much it will be much simpler and a lot more appropriate to place it in its rightful place, the garbage place of history. And this is the garbage, Madam Chairman, and this is the resolution, and this is the place for it. 
One on the, on the one hand, it will become one with similar resolutions adopted with regards to the Jewish people. On the other hand, it might get a bit crowded between uncountable UN Human Rights Council resolution, the UN in New York resolutions, UNESCO resolutions, and other diabolical ideologies for the destruction of Israel, devised by past empires and dictators not worthy of us mentioning them, all of which have this in common, they all disappeared of the stage of history, existing no more, while the people of Israel is alive and well, and the blue and white flag with the star of David, Magen David, is waving above Jerusalem, our eternal and united capital. Like any Jewish groom in the past 2,000 years, on my wedding day, just before giving myself to my beloved wife, I swore before one and all, if I forgot you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. As long as I'm Israel high. The ridiculous position of the Arab states incorporated into this resolution is a complete affront to history, as reported in the Jerusalem Post. Netanyahu suggested that the Bible aside, UNESCO members should visit the Arch of Titus. On it, one can see what the Romans brought back to Rome after they destroyed and looted the Second Temple on the Temple Mount 2,000 years ago. There, engraved on the Arch of Titus, is a seven-branched menorah that is the symbol of the Jewish people, and I remind you, is also the symbol of the Jewish state today, he said. Soon UNESCO will say that the Emperor Titus engaged in Zionist propaganda, Netanyahu said. To say that Israel has con no connection to the Temple Mount and the Western Wall is like saying that China has no connection to the Great Wall of China or that Egypt has no connection with the pyramids. By this absurd decision, UNESCO has lost what little legitimacy it had left, Netanyahu added. The gross distortion of the truth being carried out by these nations is not to be underestimated, as it is the spirit of madness that will eventually bring the nations down to Jerusalem to battle. We live in a day and an age where basic scientific fact is on its head. When a boy can call himself a girl, and despite obvious biological evidence, the world accepts this as the truth. It is a time lamented by the prophet Isaiah, who writes in chapter 5, verse 20, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Well, this is the spirit of the age in which we live. White is called black, and everyone agrees when obviously it isn't. The nations are drunk. Well, the connection to Israel and the Temple Mount goes back to the beginning of time. It was the place where Abraham took Isaac and inaugurated the connection between the mountain and the Jews. We read in Genesis 22, verse 1, It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell thee of. It was to Jerusalem that David brought the Ark of the Covenant in First Chronicles 5, verse 3, where we read, David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Lord into his place, which he had prepared for it. It was also here that Solomon built the first temple, Second Chronicles 3, verse 1. Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared to David his father in the place that David had prepared, in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. In his speech of dedication, Solomon identified the link between Jerusalem and the temple, and the God of Israel, citing the words of the king of the universe. Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among the tribes of Israel to build an house in, that my name might be there, Neither chose I any man to be ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Second Chronicles 3 verses 5 to 6. In his prayer of dedication, Solomon identified the Temple Mount as the place where Jews were to pray toward for deliverance. We read in 2 Chronicles 6, verse 19, 
Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant, and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee, that thine eyes may be open upon this house day and night, upon the place where thou hast said that thou wouldest put thy name there, and to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth towards this place. Hearken, therefore, unto the supplication of thy servant, and to thy people Israel, which they shall make towards this place, hear from thy dwelling place, even from heaven, and when thou hearest, forgive. So after the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, Israel returned and rebuilt it during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And God confirmed his hand in the rebuilding. As we read in Zechariah 4 verse 9, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall all shall finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. And again, it was destroyed at the hand of the Romans in AD 70. But this was only to last for a period of time. As David's son, the Lord Jesus Christ describes in Luke 21 verse 24. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. End quote. Well, that regathering has taken place during the past 100 years, fulfilling the words of the prophets and the hopes of the people of Israel and believers of the Bible worldwide. To deny the connection of the people to Israel with the Temple Mount or Jerusalem is to deny the existence of God himself or the truth of his word. For thousands of years the Temple Mount was in the hands of the Gentiles, either the Romans or Turks. This is not to be the case anymore. The Palestinian quest is to dominate the Temple Mount and erase Israel's historical connection is doomed. It is reminiscent of the goal of the nations surrounding Israel during the period of the Babylonian invasion. They thought the holy places would be theirs in possession, and ridiculed the people of God as we read in Ezekiel 36 verses 1 to 4. Also, thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha! Even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Therefore prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Because they made you desolate, and swallowed you up on every side, that ye might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen, and are taken up in the lips of talkers, and are an infamy of the people. Therefore ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God, Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, and to the rivers, and to the valleys, and to the desolate places, and to the cities that are forsaken, which are become a prey and a derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. Well, he goes on. But the arrogance of the nations went beyond this. Similar to Anesco, they appointed God's land to their own possession in rejoicing, as we continue to read. Verse 5. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations, and against all Idumea, which is Edom, which have appointed my land into their possession, with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds, to cast it out for a prey. Well, UNESCO and the World Court will have no say over the land, not because of historical claims, not because of archaeological evidence, but because there is a God in heaven who is alive today, and his word is alive also. It is his land, and he appointed it once again to Israel. Newsflash, the times of the Gentiles are over. Yet the nations of the world will not listen to reason. They are drunk with an intoxicating drink that will bring them down into the land. The issue will be Jerusalem. It is when Jerusalem is in Jewish hands that the nations lift up their hands against God's people, as we read in Joel 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations and parted my land. Well, UNESCO's vote was interesting because one of the few non-Muslim nations that voted in favor was Russia. And among the nations who abstained, not having the spine to state their real feelings, were Spain, France, 
Greece, Italy, and Ukraine, all who will be joining Russia in the future invasion of the land as, ex as described in Ezekiel chapter 38. Among those nations who opposed the resolution were the United States and Great Britain, as well as the Netherlands and others, some of which will form the opposition to the Gogian invasion as part of the nations of Ezekiel 38 and verse 13. Well, Zechariah records the same future event in chapter 14, verse 2, where he says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city go, shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. However, although there will be tragic events, it will not be like previous invasions of Israel by the Babylonians and the Romans, because God will intervene. Because we read in verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. The future of Jerusalem and Israel is certainly not in the hands of the United Nations, or the hostile nations of the world. It has been determined by Almighty God himself. Jerusalem isn't just any city, it's the city of the Messiah, as we read in Psalm 48, verses 1 to 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. It is the eternal capital of Israel. It's not just a place where the first and second temples were built as houses of prayer to the God of Israel, but will be the place where the third temple will shortly be built. The Psalms tell us God's thoughts on the situation where God, in Psalm 78, verses 68 to 69, chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount of Zion, which he loved, and he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which he hath established forever. Now this isn't just historical, but eternal, and soon to be established again, as we read in Zechariah 1 verse 17. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall choose Jerusalem. Well, this prophecy is very specific, that Jerusalem again will be the center of world worship. It doesn't belong to the Palestinians, Muslims, or Catholic nations of Europe or the Russians, but to the God of Israel. We read in Psalm 132, verse 13, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. And again in Zechariah 2, verse 12, And the Lord shall yet inherit Judah his portion, the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. It's from here that the house of prayer will be built again. As we read in Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge amongst the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So all nations will be invited to come and pray there, but only to the God of Israel. So we await this glorious time, and let us join the prayer of the psalmist. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chiefest joy. Psalm 137, verses 5 to 6. Thank you for listening to the Bible in the News. We leave you the words of Psalm 137, sung in Hebrew by Israelis living in Jerusalem today, in and of itself a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This has been Jonathan Bowen joining you. Yeah,
back Oh, no. 